This is curly grass fern. Scuzzea fusilla is a tiny rare fern associated with the roots of Atlantic white cedar. Early botanist Elizabeth Britton and Alexandria Taylor studied the life cycle of this plant in 1901. Their scientific illustrations of the spores and germination were published in the Bulletin of the Tory Botanical Club. There are only a few plant or fern identification books that feature illustrations of the habit or the overall form of this plant. With so many tiny features and a tangle of leaves at the base, it really is a challenge to illustrate something like this. Skyzea fusilla is a rare plant, ranked S3 in New Jersey. This is not a species that I could legally or ethically collect. I've been trying to sketch it in the field, in situ, for years, but no matter how long I give myself, I just can't seem to finish a drawing. You really have to get on the ground to see it, which is uncomfortable, and there's also the risk of crushing other nearby specimens. So I came up with an alternative. This is one of the cases where I'm going to say it's okay to work from a photograph. But in order to do this successfully, I needed to do some of my own research. I was very fortunate to find a large population of Skyzea procilla, and I selected one with a fallen log behind it to be the specimen that I would illustrate. So using a grid that I made myself with a sheet of acetate, um, I photographed the specimen. So each square is um, one inch, and then I have it broken up into quarters. I decided to do this so I could scale up the specimen when I'm back in the studio and make it four times life size. So while I was in the field, I looked at as many specimens as I could, photographing them, taking short little videos, and trying to get a good visual image of the form and the color of the specimens. Back in the studio, I used a grid to help me scale up the specimen to about four times life size. After completing a basic line drawing, I flipped it over. I was working on tracing paper, so here you see me just rubbing um, the back side of the illustration so I can transfer it to my good paper. I decided that I wanted to do this in full color, so I'll be transferring it to watercolor paper and painting in watercolor. I took a few breaks from working on the illustration to um, go back through some of the research that I was reading. Looking back at Britton and Taylor's work, I learned that the curly leaves have glandular hairs. I could just make out a row of white glandular dots on the leaves, a feature that I've not yet seen illustrated. The leaves spiral, but they're also flattened like ribbons. The scientific description for this is linear, slender, and tortuous. It would be tortuous to try to draw something like this. It takes very close observation, and you would need to be able to render it. Details like this are challenging, but getting them right makes the illustration more accurate, helps distinguish form, and can help me visually map out which features are in the foreground. I was really excited to learn that Britton and Taylor found fungal hyphae in their specimens of Skyzea priscilla. The role of fungi in swamps and other wetlands isn't very well understood, so it would be very cool to re-examine this relationship and try to better identify the fungi that associate with Skyzea priscilla. Preparing a transfer sheet for your drawing is really the easiest step in any piece of botanical art. Um, some tips that I've learned are to use a hard pencil. I usually start drawing in 4H, um, and on the back I'll either use a 4H or a 2H, because remember, we want to minimize the amount of graphite left behind on the paper. If you were to use a softer pencil, it would smudge, you'd have a harder time cleaning it up, 
and the layer underneath your first watercolor layers will be a little muddy. Having a layer of graphite underneath your watercolor may bleed through depending on how light your painting is. So I'm using the tracing paper so I can transfer my illustration to the watercolor paper as light as possible. I use a kneaded eraser to lift off any excess graphite. So the graphite is just barely visible by the time I'm ready to start painting. It's a good idea to mark which side of your transfer sheet is the top because when you're ready to transfer it, you'll end up having thin graphite pencil lines on both sides of the transfer paper. I'm using a 100% cotton, high quality hot press paper for the watercolor illustration. Um, here, here's a sample of it in a pad, but the piece that I'm using for the final illustration was cut from a roll of paper. Now we're starting the actual process of transferring the drawing. For 9 by 12 or 11 by 14, this usually takes me about two hours. Um, with this one, I'm going to be especially careful transferring it because there are a lot of intersecting lines and I want to make sure that I don't miss any small segments. I also want to make sure that the piece is centered, so I'm double checking with the ruler to make sure that I have it in the right position. And now for the big reveal, it's transferred. You can barely see it, but I'm actually going to lighten these lines with a kneaded eraser so I have even less graphite that's visible. When we say botanical art is slow, it really is. This is probably about four hours into the process of doing the illustration and doing the transfer. And I was working from a photograph as reference, so it was probably a little faster than drawing from life. I'm getting ready to start my watercolor, and I'm using the kneaded eraser to not only lift off graphite, but any little other specks that might be on the paper. Here I'm finally starting to take the watercolors out and do my first tea washes. A tea wash is the lightest wash of watercolor that you can do on a piece of paper. It's important that these first layers are really light because with watercolor you need to start preserving the highlights from the very beginning. It's almost impossible to get the highlights back once you've already painted the surface. 
While I was working on my first few watercolor layers, I decided that it would be a really good idea to go back to the field and look at a few more specimens. This time I brought a small jeweler's loop with um, 10x magnification so I could take some photos and just get a closer look at the leaves. I want to be able to see the highlights and shadows where they're overlapping and I want a better sense of the form. When I returned to the studio, I had a much better understanding of how I needed to render the form so I was ready to start putting shadows in place, and I used the dry brush technique to do this. Dry brush is where you work from a watercolor skin, so you mix your watercolor pigment, the color that you need it to be, and you allow it to dry on the palette. Then you go back in with a very lightly dampened brush. Dry brushing allows you to build up color slowly and have more control over it than using the wet on wet technique. This technique takes a lot of patience and you need very tiny brushes. It can also be kind of rough on the bristles of your brush and wear them out easily. My goal was to finish this illustration over the next couple of weeks, working on it a little bit, maybe one to two hours per day until it's finished. But now that I've started the dry brushing, you can see that it's coming along pretty nicely and it's much easier to see the details starting to take shape. So now that we're this far along, you can finally see the details that make this specimen a fern. So the fertile fronds are at the top. They're those little kind of triangular shaped pieces, and each one of those contains spores. Um, I think that I counted between six and eight segments for each of these, so they would split up and unfurl and the spores would be released. In the winter, after the spores are released, this part of the frond will turn brown, and you'll see that it has curled back on itself. So you can usually find the fertile fronds if a specimen had them in early spring as well. The new fronds will emerge, I think, in early summer. They start out light green, and then as you see here, they're kind of an olivey, yellowish green. It might seem like all I'm painting is green, but if you were to look at the specimen very closely, you can see that it does have a 3D structure. So even though um, the leaves are linear and thin, they do have an edge. So on those edges, you get highlights on one side, you get shadows on another side. Where things overlap, you have the same balance 
of chiaroscuro, you know, lights and darks. And that helps differentiate between what's in the foreground, what's in the background, and just the overall form of the specimen. Thank you for watching, and I hope you learned something today about Skyzea fusilla or the process of creating a botanical illustration in watercolor. Please consider subscribing for more botanical art content.